great pleasure to introduce uh, industry legend and serial entrepreneur, Tom Siebel. Okay, testing one, two, three. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Siebel, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our experience in what's going on with the Internet of Things. Uh, this is my fourth decade in the information technology business. I am a computer scientist from the University of Illinois. In the early 80s, I sold relational database technology into most of your companies to your predecessors, and uh, later on, introduce CRM technology into uh, your companies uh, to your predecessors in, say, a decade later. And, uh, you know, this guy is kind of where all got started 70 years ago, which is, um, uh, you came out of Bell Labs with William Shockley and John Bardeen, and this was the beginning of our business. And then since then, uh, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore and others you know, figured out how to miniaturize this technology. And uh, after a while, we uh, figured out ways to do useful things with it. And so we have all this, this phenomenon known as Moore's Law, with which you're all very familiar. But now it seems to be accelerating. You know, I'm not really certain that the physics of how many um, transistors that they can fit on a chip is, in fact, continuing to double every uh, 18 months. You know, but the economics are clearly accelerating and at the cost with, with, with this phenomenon called the cloud, uh, where the, the cost of storage and the cost of computing is now a falling knife. And you know, five, well, five years ago, perhaps very few of your organizations were moving into the cloud, and now I think you all are, and at least every customer that we call on the world is. So this, is, this phenomenon has happened very, very quickly. And I think unless your programs are written in Algol, and your program on a Burroughs computer in 10 years, I mean, you won't have a machine room. Okay, you won't have a data center. Okay, and so we've seen over this period of time, uh, as the cost of computing has gone down, we've seen, we've developed useful technologies from mainframe computing to mini computing to personal computing, a relational database technology, enterprise application software, CRM, uh, 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 the Ethernet, Internet. And all of those were complete replacement markets for every, every um, uh, uh, technology that preceded it. And the global market for information technology has grown from you know, a very small number as early as 1980 to, say, a couple of trillion dollars worldwide today. And so if we look at the vectors, if we look at 2017, and you know, kind of what's, what's clearly happening next, well, this phenomenon of cloud computing is is, is, is dramatically accelerating, and I predict that in 10 years, you know, you will not have a machine room. It will be, and again, unless you're programming, unless you're running Burroughs computers, running Algol programs or Fortran programs, you won't have a machine room. Okay, we have this, you know, change in social human computer action, both through the device in your pocket and through, through natural language processing, which is kind of changing everything about the interaction model. This phenomenon of big data, which is a very interesting phenomenon. And you know, big data is less about the size of the data than it is a completely different means of computing. Uh, where, I mean, it doesn't really matter that it's, a, that it's a, a terabyte instead of a gigabyte or a yottabyte instead of a megabyte. OK, what matters is, with big data, is there's no sampling error. So we're using all of the data, and this is what big data is all about. It's a completely different computational metaphor, whereas previously, due to the limitations of storage and the limitations of computational devices, uh, we, would, uh, we would basically compute based upon samples and then you know, make inferences from those samples. Well, with big data, there is no sampling error. This, what's going on in machine learning with AI, uh, machine learning and deep learning is it changes absolutely everything about computing. Okay, and this is a field where now you know in its in its embryonic stage, you know, the cell is divided about four times. And what we will see happen in the next in the next ten years there is going to is going to be simply remarkable. The last kind of macro trend that we see going on, you know, in the next twenty years is this phenomenon called the Internet of Things. In the Internet of Things, you know, this has to do with the censoring of value chains, whether it's uh, utilities, electric utilities, oil and gas, travel and transportation, 
uh, uh, entertainment, um, of the pharmaceutical industry, you name it, all of these value chains are being censored. And the number of devices that were installed in these value chains as of the beginning of this century was about a half a billion. It's about 19 billion today, and it'll about, be about 50 billion in five years, okay? This is a big deal, okay? This is, this is bigger than cloud computing. Because what it does to these value chains, it changes everything about the way we design products, everything about the way we manufacture products, everything the way, every, every, everything about the way that we deliver products and services, and everything about the way we manage those processes. Okay, and it changes everything away about the way that we provide the information technology support to support those business processes. So this is a this is a very big phenomenon. So if we look at the adoption across industry of these devices, it's, you know, it's virtually across all industries. And uh, by, in five years, it'll, I mean, it won't be fully penetrated, but there'll be 50 billion devices. Now, so we've been involved in an effort for the last five years in a company called C3 IoT, okay, where we live at the convergence of these trends um, and you know, building a platform I mean, so what does this enable, okay? Big data, cloud-scale computing, where we're aggregating data sets that were inconceivable at the beginning of this century, okay? We're processing data at acquisition rates that were at data aggregation rates that were not fathomable at the beginning of the century, okay? Through elastic cloud computing, you know, we can, you know, we can throw virtually infinite computational capacity at these problems, and now with AI, we're able to solve classes of problems that were, that were heretofore unsolvable, generally in the area of predictive analytics. And so this is predictive maintenance. With the killer app in IoT, hard stop is predictive maintenance. Okay, whether it's aerospace, whether it's automotive, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's healthcare, predictive maintenance is the killer app. Okay, and whether we're, do, whether we, in, we're do, in the oil and gas chain, we're doing predictive maintenance for oil and gas production assets. Okay, uh, well completion analytics, well placement analytics, well production analytics. And the grid, $2 trillion is being invested this decade, bringing IoT to the grid. This is this move, $2 trillion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pretty big number. For those of you who are around when the internet, we brought the internet to the market and say, when it spun out of the University of Illinois would have been 92, 1993, 1994. Um, and uh, nobody was thinking about spending $2 trillion on the internet. But this hard stop is being spent right now to censor the entire value chain from the thermostat to the step-up transformer to the step-down transformer to the vibration sensor and the nuclear reactor to the smart meter. And we can use those telemetry. Uh, the internet, as you might know, or excuse me, the grid, as you may be aware, is the largest, most complex machine ever built. And we can use that telemetry uh, to dramatically improve the efficiency of the machine uh, and dramatically reduce the greenhouse footprint. So this is, this is basically a, an IoT problem, big data IoT. Smart cities, whether this is traffic convection, whether this is, whether is, whether this is security, whether this is dealing with, with, with terror, smart cities is a, is a huge application. Healthcare analytics, I'll talk more about this more. The next generation of CRM, I know, yeah, I was involved in CRM. I think I invented CRM, okay? And, uh, you know, the, the, the next generation, you know, about, of CRM is definitely CRM meets AI, and we can talk about that some other time. Autonomous vehicles, this is an IoT big data AI problem. Uh, supply chain optimization, stochastic optimization of the supply chain, supply network risk. Okay, we're able to solve problems there that were not solved. I'll talk about a few. So McKinsey estimates that the value that companies will realize from IoT applications in a relatively short period of time is between uh, five and 11, I think it says trillion dollars there. I don't have my glasses on, but I'm pretty sure that's what it says. And this is across, you know, whether it's across uh, uh, aerospace, travel and transportation, healthcare, automotive, pharmaceutical, entertainment, home automation, logistics, this changes everything. Uh, there's an article that I will recommend to you written by Michael Porter in the Harvard Business Review. He did it in two years, I think. One in, in uh, um, 
maybe October, November, I think it was one in 13 and one in 14. But Michael Porter argues that the whole world, what has changed, there's a whole change in computing to smart connected devices. And this requires an entirely new technology platform. Okay, and he, and he argues that companies that do in, did not adopt this new technology platform, that basically allows the aggregation of data from large and diverse data sets into unified federated images, the processing of these data sets at machine speed, and then the application of AI to deal with this new world of smart connected devices, companies that do not make that transition, okay, will cease to be competitive in their markets. Uh, the estimated size of this market for IoT software, this is estimated to be a quarter of a trillion dollar market in 2023. So this would be an entire replacement market for everything that's going on in enterprise application software today. So I've been involved in some pretty rapidly growing markets before. Relational database market was a rapidly growing market. CRM market was a rapidly growing market. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Quarter of a trillion dollars. This would be larger than the entire IT industry when I went to work at Oracle in 1983. Okay, and so as a CIO, what is the decision you're gonna make? You know, the decision you're gonna make is build versus buy, just like you always did, okay? I called on at least half of your organizations when we, use, when, when, we, when we brought Oracle to market. What could you possibly use a relational database for? You already had ISAM and vSAM, right? And you decided you need one, well, we'll just build it ourselves. Everybody tried. How about enterprise application software? Whether it's ERP, accounting, you know, CRM, what could you possibly use that for? I mean, you would build it yourself, and many of you tried or brought on Accenture and you know, brought you know, 100 Accenture people on for five years to build it yourself. Um, and um, you know, so basically the decision you're gonna face, is what you're facing right now is a build versus buy decision. And we have all this issue about, about what is this vendor lock-in stuff? I mean, why on earth would you be locked into Ford Motor Company to buy a car when you could go to the auto parts store? I mean, you guys have degrees from MIT and, or Florida State or somewhere, you know, and you go to the auto store, so you could buy all the parts and build it yourself. You don't have the vendor lock-in to Ford. Um, and then you gotta maintain it yourself. All you gotta do is, you know, throw Thousand engineers at it for a couple of years. Um, I mean, what's the class of problems that you need to solve? Here, you need to solve the data aggregation problem to aggregate large data sets out of the enterprise. You need a persistence problem. You need to process data sets that are unfathomably large. You need platform services, encryption at rest, encryption at motion, access, uh, access control, okay, ETL, queuing. MapReduce, map, batch processing, stream processing, data science services. And the way to do that is, the easiest way to do that is go to the Apache Open Source Hadoop stack. It's free. How hard could this be? Just take about 70 of this, these, these software products and use structured programming, okay, to stitch them together into a seamless, cohesive whole that solves the problem. So you can get all these products, okay, none of which were viable enough to make it commercially, all of which were developed by separate organizations in different languages with different APIs and different storage metaphors, and just take them together and you know, throw a couple thousand engineers at it for five years, okay, and take you know, Flume and Uzi and Zookeeper and Hive and Kafka and build a piece of enterprise application software to solve the IoT problem. How hard can it be? Well, it's pretty hard. Okay, I, okay. I think if you do on the math on this, the level of complexity that you need to deal with by the deal with all the devices, all the APIs, all the machine classifiers, it's like, you know, say, you have to deal with like 10 to the 13th. You have to grok 10 to the 13th, not only to build it, but to build an application with it. Hey, there's not a lot of people other than those who graduated from MIT who can deal with 10 to the 13th. We went about it a little different way, okay? So what we did is we took seven years, about a quarter of a million dollars, and wrote a million lines of Java code in something that's called a model-driven architecture. If you do a Wikipedia on model-driven architecture, it's kind of the next generation of technology, okay, where all of these are in containers, 
And what we built is basically a type of system. So there's no vendor lock in here. And we built the ability to aggregate large data sets, you know, the unified federated data, which process the data at machine speed, and then apply AI. And now we've deployed these applications at large industrial scale at about 24 or five organizations around the world. And I'll talk about a couple, some of these quickly. Um, this is a $50 billion discrete manufacturer. OK, in this, in this instance, we're aggregating 23 petabytes of information from 3,000 enterprise data sources, 50 instances of SAP in a unified federated image. Building the applications we're building on it simultaneously would include uh, uh, stochastic optimization of the supply chain, supply network risk, predictive maintenance, and, and, and customer churn. Uh, this is chronic disease prevention. In this organization, we aggregated a unified federated image of 100 million patient records, hematology, pharmacology, radiology, patient history, a unified federated image, and then we built a mean machine learning classifier that'll predict um, were we to prescribe opiates to this population, who is predisposed to addiction? Addiction. We do that with 78% uh, precision. That organization is now moving 100 data scientists in with us to build a thousand, count them, a thousand. Um, uh, predictive analytics healthcare applications. Uh, this is a credit card company. You have one of their credit cards in your, in your wallet. And what we did is we took 24 million of their cardholders, took all the customer records they had for those 23 mil million people and 27 million points of purchase. We aggregated those data in a unified federated image and built a machine classifier that will predict. We actually did that in three days. OK, and then we built a machine learning classifier that will predict how much money each of those people are going to spend tomorrow, and what's the probability that they're going to use their card. Uh, Enel, uh, you've heard about Enel. They're a pretty big business, uh, largest uh, utility in the free world. They have 60 million meters in 40 countries. S putting this into perspective, there are 100 million meters in the United States. So in this case, we've taken two thirds of those meters, I think 42 million meters, and we've aggregated the data from all of their enterprise information systems, SAP, customer care and billing, meter data management, CRM, work order management, infrastructure, uh, 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 um, two different SCADA systems, network topology, what have you. We aggregated those data in a unified federated image. It gets updated at basically at, at uh, you know, once per second. Uh, we process transactions peak, at peak rates of a million transactions per second, and we apply AI to five different applications, predictive maintenance for 10 gigawatts of renewable generation, 65 gigawatts of conventional generation, um, predictive maintenance for 2 million kilometers of, of, uh, of uh, distribution assets, and then fraud detection for 42 million endpoints. Uh, this is uh, a company, uh, this is uh, Origin Energy. In, uh, in uh, uh, Australia, uh, where we have built now and are deploying across 39 uh, uh, fields, basically two applications. Well, it, one is well production analytics. Before they punch a hole in the ground, we can tell them with about 80% precision whether it's going to be a low producing well, a medium producing well, or a high producing well. And the idea of it's going to be a low producing well, don't punch the hole in the ground. And the other is, Predictive analytics for well production assets, we've demonstrated we can extend the life of their assets by 365 days. This is the most difficult problem we've ever done by far. This is a $39 billion discrete manufacturing company, and the problem we solved was stochastic optimization of the inventory. They carry $6 billion worth of inventory. The things that they, have, have, that they make have as many as 21,000 uh, components in their bill of materials, and they want to optimize the inventory levels across all of their parts and all of their factories. And we've demonstrated that we can reduce their inventory carrying cost by 35 to 52%. Uh, here, this is Airbus, where we're building the hangar of the future. Uh, NG, NG is roughly an 80 billion euro integrated energy company based in Paris. Oil and gas, natural gas, LNG, gas distribution, electricity distribution. Here we're in the process of building 28 IoT applications across 24 lines of business. For all of those, we'll, we, we build a center of excellence. We're deploying two applications into production every six months for the next five years. The expected economic benefit of this application is um, 1 billion euros a year in recurring economic benefit. Smart cities, uh, LNG optimization, LNG terminal predictive maintenance, what have you. So this is all based upon a type system that we built. I encourage, if you're interested, do a Wikipedia on the idea of a model-driven architecture. 
Um, it's, a, it's a new generation of technology. The Wikipedia site is really good. And this is what we've done. We've done a type system which does which, which creates this thing so everything is addressable through a restful, uh, uh, through a restful uh, interface call. Um, it is entirely future-proofed, and there's absolutely no vendor lock-in. Okay? You own the data, you own the application, you own the machine learning classifier, and you can move it on any platform you want. So I believe that I'm pretty confident that to this date we have deployed um, more industrial, we have basically 100 million meters under management today. Our, our business increased like about 600% last year. And our average customer is somewhere, our customers are generally between 30 and, and $200 billion. So this is happening now. It's happening very quickly. Actually, virtually every one of these initiatives, by the way, is a, is a, is a CEO-led initiative. So this is the first time we've seen this in, in my career was the CEO pounding on the table, usually appointing a chief digital officer with the CIO and mandating that it get done, uh, rather than these other general, you know, when we did mini computers and personal computers and relational database and CRM and application software, that kind of came up through the ranks. You were there, okay? You wrote, your people did the RFPs, okay? And it, but this is kind of a top-down process, and it's happening very fast. It's very big. It's very exciting. and. Uh, this is what we see going on in machine learning, cloud computing, big data, and IoT. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to talk with you, and thank you for the courtesy.